The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. So Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Joseph had given to his that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not have things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when, all, when, when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want, or, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. 
Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed with them two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. And let us pray. May the words of my lips and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, last week we were introduced to Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, a, a renowned teacher who came to Jesus by night and lasted all of nine verses in conversation with Jesus before fading back into the night from whence he came. Now this week, we learn of another character's encounter with Jesus. The Samaritan woman by the well in the bright noonday sun. Now remember, in this fourth gospel, dark is always more than just dark. And light is always more than just light. Darkness is the symbol of unbelief. And light is the symbol of God's truth and, and revelation. The contrast between Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman is striking. And, giving, and given the fact that both stories appear side by side in this gospel account tells us that we are meant to notice this contrast in all its details. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, an insider, a leader of the Jewish people. He's a man. He has a name. But he comes to Jesus by cover of night. The character to whom we're introduced in this week's reading is a Samaritan, a political and religious outsider, she is a woman with no name, but she meets Jesus in full daylight. And the contrast between their conversations with Jesus is even more striking. Whereas Nicodemus cannot seem to hear that Jesus is sent by God, the woman at the well hears the actual name of God. I am I mean, I know that your English translations say, I am He. But the Greek says, Ego Ami, I am. The very way God's name given to Moses from the burning bush was translated in, in, the, in the Greek Old Testaments. I am. While Nicodemus last questioning words to Jesus, Expose his, his disbelief. How can this be? The last words of this woman at the well also poses a question. He cannot be the Christ, can he? Lead her to witness to her whole town. At the very beginning of this story, just before our printed text in verse 4, we are told by the Gospel writer that Jesus had to go through Samaria. That He had to go. Well, no, no He did not. Jewish pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem took the detour around Samaria all the time. They would go from Jewish village to Jewish village to Jewish village to avoid accidental contamination from associating unnecessarily with these Samaritans, these vile religious half-breeds. So no, he did not have to go through Samaria. The word translated as had to is actually the Greek word day, meaning it was necessary. It was necessary that Jesus go through Samaria. And whenever that word appears, 
in the New Testament, we know that God is at work behind the scenes to accomplish His perfect plan and purpose. Why is it necessary for Jesus to go through Samaria? Well, we heard last Sunday. Because God sent His Son into the world. And going to the world includes Samaria. It includes a vulnerable woman on the edges of society. He had to go through Samaria in order to find her. The encounter between this woman and Jesus can be read in, in, in three movements. And that first movement is about water. About water. When Jesus asks the Samaritan woman for a drink, she is absolutely astounded that he is even talking to a Samaritan, let alone asking her for something. And the evangelist explains why this is justified. Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus' thirst leads to a conversation with a woman wherein he offers her living water gushing up to eternal life, which then, in turn, she asks for. Now, the reference to, to living water is a play on words in Greek, one that my grandparents would have understood because they used living water this way, but, but we don't tend to nowadays. That phrase, living water, can refer to water that is flowing rather than still, fresh rather than stagnant, but, but it can also mean literally alive. Alive, linking it to the gift of eternal life, gushing up in the believer who receives Jesus' gift. Like Nicodemus, when he is unable to look beyond the earthly, physical birth to the spiritual birth from above, and the disciples' later misunderstanding of Jesus' reference to food and nourishment at the end of this story, the woman here, at first, seems to be stuck at the literal level, thinking only of water as water drawn from Jacob's well. But unlike Nicodemus, who does not seem to move beyond his confusion, this woman does move. She asks for this water, realizing that it is not ordinary water, but not yet understanding what that means. This sets up the second movement of the story, the conversation about this woman's private life, which is when the whole conversation really seems to change. Did you notice that? Jesus tells her everything she had ever done, as she later puts it. Now, sometimes, sometimes we tend to read this rather judgmentally. A five-time loser hopping from one failed relationship to another. A scarlet letter kind of woman. But you know, that may not be the case at all. Notice, notice nowhere in the conversation does Jesus tell her to go and sin no more. I mean, what if this woman has been widowed five times with no children to support her? What if she's been divorced time and time again by a string of, of selfish, shallow husbands trading her in on, on a newer, sleeker model. I mean, what if this relationship that she's in right now is something legal and socially acceptable, but does not afford her the full rights and protection of a recognized first wife? The issue here seems to be of her vulnerability and her lack of status rather than her morality. She is someone who is easy to overlook. She's one of those needy persons, the working poor, who often fall through the cracks of society. The people that we find it so very easy to, to regularly ignore as we go about our daily lives, but yet Jesus sees her. 
Jesus sees her. Jesus knows her. He understands her. What is so life-changing for this woman is that Jesus really knows her. And this being known then enables her to trust Him. I mean, she immediately understands that this man is some kind of a prophet. And so she asks a very serious question about worship to which He gives a very serious answer. Hers is not some theological diversion to move Jesus away from addressing her personal life, which is the way I often interpreted this passage and even preached on it. No. No. This woman really wants to know where is God to be worshipped? It's an important question because it determines how God is to be worshipped. If it's on Mount Gerizim, then it's with prayers and psalms, but it can't be with sacrifices because sacrifices can only be offered in Jerusalem. And then if it's in Jerusalem, then it is that whole sacrificial system. Who is right? What is truly acceptable to God? Where and how are we to worship? She trusts Him enough to ask this important question. And then this leads directly to the third movement of our story. The conversation about worship in spirit and in truth, which leads her to wondering about the Messiah and His revealing to her that He is. To worship God as God wants to be worshipped is to worship in spirit. Presumably with the spirit, the living water that Jesus Himself offers gushing up in the believer to eternal life and, and in truth, which we will later understand to be Jesus Himself as in the truth, the life, the way. Genuine worship then is about relationship. About relationship, dwelling, abiding in the true vine, Jesus. The Samaritan woman has entered into relationship with Him here. And so she slowly begins to understand this. For it is then that she suggests in her own very roundabout way that He might be the coming Messiah. And for the first and only time in this Gospel account, Jesus says that He is. Well, what He really says is, I am the very name of God. Jesus reveals who He is to this woman. So this story is really about Jesus truly knowing this woman, seeing her for who she is, so that she is able to begin to see Jesus for who Jesus is. Being given the gift of truth that leads to real worship and becoming a conduit of that living water, the life of the Spirit. Being found by and, and being known by this Jesus transforms her, changes her identity from that weary victim trudging to the well in the heat of the day to a witness. To a witness. I mean, did you notice? She leaves her water jug behind and becomes a forerunner to the proclamation of the gospel. Now many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. According to this account of gospel, the Samaritan woman joins with John the Baptist in pointing to this one who is truly the Savior of the world. Jesus reveals who He is to this woman and through their encounter, 
to her neighbors. And finally, and finally, to all of us. So this would seem to suggest to us that it's not so much about what we know and how well we know it, but rather who we know and who knows us. It is about having an encounter, experiencing the light of Jesus' truth and love shining on our past and on our future. And, unlike Nicodemus last week, then having the courage and the wherewithal to leave our jugs behind and go and share what we know, who we know, as witnesses to the abundant grace gushing up in us to eternal life. You know, our, our former assistant to the bishop assigned to East Tennessee, Delmer Chilton, well, really, I should say our former, former assistant to the bishop because uh, Paul Summer replaced him and now he has resigned, so, so two assistant bishops ago. And I don't know what it is with us in East Tennessee that we're so hard to serve, but anyway, Delmer Chilton tells a story about when he was first ordained. It was in a small congregation near Fort Bragg, North Carolina. An old college friend of his drove the several hours to attend his ordination and installation. And after the service that evening, he gave Delmer a ride back to the house where he was staying. Their route took them directly through the seediest part of town where all the working girls offered their services to the GIs. And they came up to a stoplight and the women spotted Delmer there dressed in his dark suit and his black clerical shirt and um, in his friend's open-bodied Jeep and they just couldn't resist. Several of them strode up to the car and began talking while the men impatiently waited for the light to change. Delmer looked over at his friend and said, get me out of here or this might be the shortest clerical career on record. And his old friend laughed as they drove away. But then he said to him, well, Delmer, I know I'm just a lowly English teacher and I don't go to church very much, but the way I read my Bible, Aren't those the very people you're supposed to be hanging out with? Delmer said that in the 35 years since, he has often wondered what might have happened if he had, instead of just sitting there in that Jeep, dressed in his suit and, and clerical shirt, tightly clutching his Bible in one hand, what might have happened if he had smiled? and turned to those women and said, Hello, my name is Delma. Would you like to talk? Maybe nothing. But maybe, just maybe for one of them, everything. And as he reflects on that evening, Delmer goes on to say, But we will never know, because I was too astonished and too afraid to try and so you see, in that very way, this story is not so much about the Samaritan woman and what she did, but rather, what would you do? What will you do when you are encountered by this Jesus and known by Him? What will you do? Because, friends, you have been, you are being encountered by Him. Amen.